Call of Duty. You love it, and you hate it. It's the most addictive illegal substance known to man. <laughs> Worth around $31 billion, Call of Duty is one of the most successful yet polarizing media franchises in the world, dominating the gaming zeitgeist for two whole decades. That's three lifetimes in 1542, or long enough to legally drink. The second most addictive legal substance. I'm mixing cod and alcohol. And I'm not even 21 yet. Yet despite this success, Call of Duty seems to have hit a low point. Uh, just a quick glance at user Metacritic scores show this waning love. Oh, that's hot. That's hot. Yet the series still sells quite well. So what's going on here? Well, to understand that, we must go back in time. To a simpler time. The 1990s. This can only go well. <gasps> Too dark. I'm sorry. Too sad. <laughs> Too far. <laughs> ah, perfect. The 1990s. <gasps> Please, just start the video. It all began with one man, Steven Spielberg. Director, producer, icon. Steven, Steven! See those movies? He made them. See these shows? He produced them. See that veteran? He scared him. <laughs> it's called Saving Private Ryan, and it's the most realistic depiction of D-Day since actual D-Day, giving PTSD to veterans across the globe. Now that is art. Is this your foot? Uh, but Steven is a visionary. And he wants to bring that trauma to children across the globe. But there's a problem. Kids can't watch R-rated movies. It's a felony. All right, boys. Tonight we're watching American Pie. So with movies off the table, Stephen considered the only sensible alternative to reach the youth. Video games. Children might not be able to watch R-rated movies, but older brothers can purchase M-rated games. Everyone knows the rules. Boobies. So, Steven would approach a different set of artists to help produce this video game, Electronic Arts, a company created for artists by artists. And oh boy, would Steven need help to develop this vision. Taking this and converting it to that is no simple feat. Remember, the year is 1999 and graphics look like this. Scary, but in a different kind of way. So the parties met and discussed how best to proceed. As EA said, Mr. Spielberg, we've read your notes, we've seen your script, and we are proud to tell you that we have created the most realistic depiction of World War II in video game history. What do you think? Let's go traumatize some kids. EA and Spielberg would collaborate to create Medal of Honor. Oh shit! A first person shooter that focused on creating a realistic vision of World War II. It was a hit. Uh, the large battles, the revolutionary graphics, the inability to sprint, all seduced gamers across the globe to go out and buy this game. And so EA did what any smart company would do. They made more. Ah! 
You've got six months for eight consoles. Underground, Frontline, Rising Sun, Pacific Assault, European Assault, Southern Assault, all within like six <gasps> years. So, but what does this have to do with Call of Duty? What the well, see that game over there? Yeah. That's Medal of Honor Allied Assault, developed by 2015 Studios and led by two men. Two very important men to the Call of Duty story, Vince Ampella and Jason West. Through their leadership, Allied Assault became a smashing success. Critical acclaim, commercial fame, even becoming the seventh most discussed game of 2002. Wow. The team is clearly very talented, and so EA, uh, being EA, wanted to own them, bring them in to the EA family to die with all the other developers. The EA execs put on their suits, grabbed their pens, and prepared for war. Mental war, as they made 2015 Studios an offer they simply couldn't refuse, saying, So, we like what you've done. And we want more. So we're prepared to make a very generous offer. That is a generous offer. Make it eight loot boxes. And you got yourself a deal. The negotiations were tense, yet after many hours, no deal was made, as many at 2015 Studios wished to stay independent of EA's control. But the corporate overlords were relentless. They leveraged their infinite wealth to bully this lesser kingdom. So Zampella and West looked over the ramparts and saw the vast EA empire at their door, a horde so large that no walls could resist. And so they did the only sensible thing. They ran, fleeing 2015 studios and sailing to uncharted waters to create a new company in the new world. It would be called Infinity Ward, led by Zampella, West, and Grant Collier. It's a small team with big dreams and modern visions, but we'll get to that. For now, the boys were free, and they could pursue whatever type of game they wanted. An FPS, an RTS, an APS. This is, after all, the Wild West. Even more boobies. So the boys met and decided what direction to take this new company, saying, All right, gentlemen and lady, what do we want to make? Pizza? No. What game do we want to make? Oh. What about a PMS? PMS? Pizza making simulator? Huh? Huh? <laughs> Who wants pizza? And after many meetings and a few deaths, the team had a new idea. But to create a game, you need money. And to get money, you need a publisher. And there's a lot of options. Good ones, bad ones, evil ones, but of all the possibilities, one publisher stood high above the rest. With acclaimed titles like Tony Hawk, Tarzan and Plaque Attack, they were the obvious choice. I am, of course, talking about Activision. So Infinity Ward created their pitch, rallied their armies, and approached Activision with one idea in mind. A concept so bold, so unthinkable, so radically different that the very foundations of the gaming world would never be the same. Hey, Activision, you want to make a Medal of Honor killer? Do bears poop in the woods? What? Do bears poop in the woods? Yes? 
You've got six weeks. Activision would purchase a 30% stake in Infinity Ward. And on October 29th, 2003, Call of Duty 1 would be released to PCs across the globe. It's a success. Uh, behind a cinematic campaign, a robust multiplayer, and an active modding community, Call of Duty 1 would become an instant classic. Uh, still alive today, unlike its children. Uh, by leveraging their experience with Medal of Honor, Infinity Ward Ward would kill Medal of Honor. Yet despite this success, they wanted more. They'd mastered the World War II genre and wished to flex their creative muscles. And you've got many options. You can go to the future, you can go to the past, but what you can't do is go to the present. Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? See, it's 2003, and literally everyone is doing this. There's no in-between. It's a proven commodity. People like being super soldiers in space, and people like being privates peeing their pants in Paris. But modern warfare? That just hits too close to home, literally. Ready for launch. Repeat. Predator missile ready for launch. Oh, finally. And I just got a five kill streak. But being entrepreneurs and risk takers, Infinity Ward dreamed of a modern shooter because the possibilities were endless. He had modern weapons, a complex geopolitical landscape, and limitless, beautiful war zones. The sandy one, the sandier one, and the sandiest one. Oh, that's hot. And so, with the massive success of Call of Duty 1, Infinity Ward looked to leverage their newly acquired clout to convince Activision to greenlight this very ambitious project. It was bold, it was visionary, it was unpredictable. And so when Infinity Ward approached Activision with the idea of a modern shooter, the fiscally conservative publisher said, <sighs> Can't you just make another World War II shooter? I mean, we'd rather not, but if we do... Can we at least have some of that money over there? What money? The order came in from headquarters. More World War II shooters. And so Infinity Ward got back to work. Four years passed and three games were released. Call of Duty 2, Call of Duty Big Red One, and Call of Duty 3. Now, these three games did a few very important things. One, they continued to build the Call of Duty brand, making it synonymous with quality and fun. And two, it transitioned the series away from the PC market and into the ballooning console landscape. Now, why would Activision do this? Well, PC piracy was a major issue at the time. Literal internet pirates would share their copies of Call of Duty with complete strangers on the internet. Disgusting. This took money out of Activision's pocket and put it directly into Mountain Dews, to which Activision said, Do it. So, Call of Duty 3 sells well, and behind the success of Xbox Live is quickly becoming the go-to FPS for Xbox players everywhere. But what happens next will change the gaming world forever. For while other developers rotated in to create these, Infinity Ward had finally received the green light to do this, a passion project to which they poured thousands of hours of research and development, interviewing soldiers, <laughs> what do you mean? shooting guns, and fighting proxy wars. You know, research. Do it. I'm a hero. November 2007, Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare was released, and my god was it glorious. It took the Call of Duty experience from here 
to here by leveraging new technology like motion capture, a new engine, and sprinting, Infinity Ward accomplished a few very important things. So one, a more dynamic, realistic single-player experience. Follow me and keep low. And two, a smoother, more complex multiplayer experience which for the first time had a dedicated team. And this created the perfect storm. You had momentum wins over there, technology tides over here, and creativity clouds everywhere, all being masterfully maestroed by the veteran hands of developers at Infinity Ward. And this storm had one destination in mind, your house. Ah. <sighs> Finally. Finish the house, and not a predator in sight. That's not good. Yep. This, this a perfect storm led to a masterpiece that created the Call of Duty model as we know it. Perks, custom classes, kill streaks, weapon attachments, camos, and of course, in-game voice chat. I give your mama some black sausage. Hey, you mama want some good black sausage? Hey, mom. Yeah. You want some sausage? All the staple features of COD have their roots in modern warfare. It is not only Infinity Ward's magnum opus, but Call of Duty's magnum opus. It's the essence of COD, the experience at its most simplistic yet rewarding. It may not be your favorite Call of Duty, but it is the most important Call of Duty objectively. It took Call of Duty's popularity from here to here, launching it into a new stratosphere of renown and firmly planting its flag as the go-to console FPS, finally pushing it past the ranks of Halo to ruin friendships across the globe. Hey guys, what if instead of Halo, we play Call of Duty? Huh? And from Modern Warfare, Little Brother Treyarch created World at War, taking the redundant theater of World War II and breathing new life into it with a new engine and multiplayer mechanics. But most importantly, World at War introduced zombies, which created an entirely new sub-community within a community. So what we have here is a golden age. Two games, which through risk taking and creativity completely take over the gaming world. This is peak COD innovation, and so if we zoom out and enhance, we can calculate about 2.1 mega hizzles of momentum. 30 million units sold, 30 million new fans, 30 million mothers defiled. Couldn't find any sausage. So if COD 1 through 3 started the engine, COD 4 and 5 dumped gasoline on it, sending this baby to the moon and setting up perhaps the most anticipated video game release since Halo 3, and ironically, the game that would kill Halo. It's called Modern Warfare 2, and it's about to piss off everyone. No, get the camera! Hey, shut the f up. It's three in the morning. And here's the camera. Modern Warfare 2 is the most recognizable Call of Duty. When you say Call of Duty, people think 1v1 on Rust. People think shotguns that are snipers. But mostly people think toxic lobbies, which expanded my vocabulary as much as it expanded COD's popularity. Oh! Timmy, watch your mouth or I'll get your father. And I'll get the camera. Oh, spare me, mom. Care to show dad this? Yeah, I deep throated well, your mom. That doesn't make sense. Please don't tell your father. And if Call of Duty 4 dumped gasoline on the franchise, Modern Warfare 2 stuck a stick of dynamite in it. It was the perfect blend, a fun multiplayer, an epic single player, and some dope spec ops with just enough controversy, just enough content warnings, just enough media coverage to pique the interest of even the most adamant Halo fan. <laughs> 
A popular new video game actually allows you to be a terrorist and kill people. Take a look. Remember, no Russian. Gonna go commit a war crime, then eat dinner. The American dream. But for all its glory, a Modern Warfare 2 represents a critical inflection point for the series. Because with success comes trouble, as Ampella and West were due royalties from Activision. Makes sense, they built this empire, they deserve some of the taxes. But you have to understand something about Activision. They're a modern company with modern ideals. They put their shareholders first and their employees second like any good publicly traded company. And so when Infinity Ward came to headquarters requesting fair compensation, Activision said, These are quite aggressive demands, but we are prepared to make a very generous offer. I think you'll find that quite appealing. That is quite generous. However, I think I've got a better offer. You're sued. <laughs> You in what army? That army. <gasps> Hi. Zampella and West would leave Infinity Ward and form Respawn Entertainment with EA, suing Activision for royalties. But this only triggered Activision's trap card, counter sue, causing them to sue EA. It's a Mexican standoff, but with American bureaucracy. <laughs> and this is the point, right here, where everything changes. After this critical departure, Modern Warfare 2 would be left in the dust, unpatched despite its many glaring issues. Uh, most infamously, One Man Army Noob Tubes. Damn it! Which corrupted this beautiful game like a hurricane. It came out of nowhere and destroyed everything and everyone in mere moments. Finally! A house that no dumb YouTube skit can destroy. <sighs> Should have built a ramp. And from here, Sledgehammer Games was brought into the fold to patch together Modern Warfare 3. And this is a big deal. See, up to this point, Treyarch and Infinity Wards cycled between titles. One year was Infinity Wards, and the next Treyarchs. This kept creative control tighter and more cohesive, which led to a clearly identifiable product. Treyarch games really felt like Treyarch games, and Infinity Ward really felt like Infinity Ward. And this kept things fresh despite the annual release cycle. But with the addition of Sledgehammer, that cohesion was lost. You got two developers working on the same game. That's one too many cooks in the kitchen with one too many terrible ideas. And this led to a stagnation of not only ideas, but production. See that reload animation? It's the same. What? See that cutscene? It's been stolen. See these maps? They're trash. <laughs> and from here, the baton of top developer would go from Infinity Ward to Treyarch, with Black Ops 1 and 2. Two, which sadly marks the end of the golden age, and not just in development mentality, but in actual gameplay. Because on November 4th, 2014, Call of Duty would never be the same, as the developers looked across the fence and saw their competitor Titanfall having a lot of fun, and more importantly, success, to which the new COD team said, Holy shit. Are you seeing this? Yeah, look at those jugs. They're huge. No, the jetpacks. We gotta do something like that. 
You see that? Yeah, that guy just died. Exactly. Write that down. Advanced Warfare represents a fundamental shift in the mentality of the series. The once scrappy underdogs were now the kings of the console kingdom, meaning they had everything to lose. Their empire had ballooned from here to here, and like any empire, they couldn't keep it together. They had Titanfall invaders in the north, the battlefield barbarians in the south, but most importantly, a giant schism growing within the empire, for two parties emerged to battle for the kingdom, the innovators and the veterans. The innovators wanted huge changes and a massive overhaul, while the veterans wanted subtle change and refinement, and these two sides would often go to war. A civil war. We need to go to the future! No, we need to go to the past! Wait, I've got a compromise. Civil War. And this division creates a seesaw effect, where developers have to balance between innovation and alienation. You need to keep things fresh, but not too fresh. You don't want to lose your core audience, and this is an incredibly difficult situation to navigate. So to deal with this complexity, Sledgehammer Games looked to other games for inspiration. Hello there. The jetpack from Titanfall, lasers from Halo, and the loot boxes from FIFA. So innovative, encouraging players to spend real money to get fake guns. Better luck next year. <laughs> so the obsidian steed, the hair trigger, and who could forget the hole puncher, which will punch a hole in your wallet as you desperately play slots to gain a competitive advantage. Holy shit. Where'd you get that gun? Oh, this thing? I bought it. Wow. How much did it cost? Um, just a few bucks. Advanced Warfare represents two major philosophical shifts for the franchise. One, following trends instead of creating trends, and two, prioritizing monetization models over gameplay. Now, many people enjoyed Advanced Warfare, but many more did not, as would be proven by the now infamous Infinite Warfare trailer, which became one of the most disliked YouTube videos of all time. That right there is a lot of dislikes. The fans were at the gates of Activision, pitchforks raised, demanding their heads. Give us a refund! No, give us their head! Show me your butt! And to appease the upset fans, Activision would bundle a remastered Modern Warfare. Uh, but to get it, you had to buy Infinite Warfare for $80. Ouch. Uh, clearly the fan base wanted change, but not just change for the sake of change. And from Infinite Warfare, the philosophy of profit over players and copying over creativity continued to plague the series. So World War II control seed the home base from Destiny to create a nice playground for players to interact and encourage one another to buy loot boxes. Holy shit, bro. You got the cancer calling card. And Black Ops 4 didn't even include a single player, yet charged a full asking price. Double ouch. Uh, the greed continued to mount with each and every release. Remember, no amount of profit will ever be enough. A publicly traded company must legally try to maximize wealth for their shareholders. No matter how well you did, you must do better, so the pressure continues to mount. One day it's loot boxes, and the next it's battle passes. So with every successful year of Call of Duty, the need to cut corners grew, and grew, and grew. And eventually, well, eventually you end up with this. Hi, I've got a .01 KD. All right, you're gonna go over there, just follow the Candy Road, and you'll be there in no time. Hi, and I've got a 2.1 KD. Oof, okay. Looks like you're going that way. Good luck. I think I'm just gonna play Fortnite instead. Wait, 
don't go anywhere. First of all, shout out to the patrons. They are the ones that make this possible, but also apparently you should watch this. It helped me out. Come on, it's just, just a click. Yeah.